Welcome back to Deke to Deke. On this episode, I have the opportunity to share the story of Dr. Janice Collins. In our sit down, Dr. Collins talks about being an ACC legend, the first Wake Forest women's basketball all ACC player, winning six Emmy Awards and much, much more. Stay tuned and don't forget to subscribe and share your favorite podcast, Deke to Deke. Take a listen and go Deeks. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Janice Collins, how are you doing? I'm great. Good morning. Good afternoon. I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be on your show. I love your show. Thank you. Thank you so much. I've been waiting for us to have this conversation. Uh, there's just so many fascinating things about you that as we've had a chance to talk offline and just get to know each other, I just found it fascinating your work uh, throughout your career. Uh, but you. you know, let's start from the beginning. Let's let's talk okay. about the doctor, the young doctor Collins. So, uh, <laughs> I know you traveled around a lot. Your father was in the military. So, yeah. where did you call home, and what was the environment like growing up? Well, I call home Virginia. I'm a Virginia girl. So yes, I am connected to so many uh, wonderful, great people of the United States, politicians and uh, uh, way back when, and uh, Virginia was such an important state, but my mother's part of the family, um, they're from Richmond, Virginia, and my father's part of the family from Eastern Shore, Chesapeake Bay, uh, Virginia, so I'm a Peninsula girl, went to Bethel High School, with same high school as um, Alan Iverson, and um, I'm right around the corner from Missy Elliott's people in Newport News, and uh, so I consider Virginia home, I love everything about Virginia, um, even though I've been all over the world, as you said, um, living in, I was born in Oklahoma uh, as a military brat. My father is amazing as my mother, my, uh, my late mother. Uh, my father was a math genius. He actually went to Virginia State uh, when I think he was like 14 or 15 uh, because he skipped so many classes in the country. He was so really smart. Um, and he ended up going into the military and he, he's a retired Lieutenant Colonel but we moved the first 14 years of my life and but virginia was always home so when my father served in vietnam twice we stayed in virginia uh, with my grandparents my mother uh, which we she ended up having six kids um, they got married uh, at 21 and 22 i think it was and by the time my dad was 29 or 30 he had six kids and so and he's been a wonderful wonderful provider he and my mother um so I was born in Oklahoma, but about two weeks or four weeks later, we moved to Germany for the first two stints. And we've lived in Kentucky and we've lived in all parts of the United States, California. And, um, and it was really, um, I would say it was really wonderful because I was able to learn about diversity at a very young age and inclusion at a very young age. And what is special and beautiful about everyone at a very young age. A lot of times, uh, because my father went up in the rankings uh, very quickly, um, did a great job. A lot of times we um, sponsored families from other parts of the world. And that was really wonderful. So we got to eat their food and we got to listen to their music and understand their religion or their spirituality. Um, and so I think that uh, my mother and father provided a wonderful, um, a wonderful life for me. And um, Virginia and DC, Maryland area, all up in the DMV, they call it, uh, is really very, very special to me still. Um, and I think that being a little bit of, a lot of military, a little bit of country, with some ocean and some Chesapeake Bay, Atlantic Ocean and like Chesapeake Bay, and a little bit of city with Richmond um, has allowed me to just um, be able to relate to a lot of different people. I never meet a stranger. I think that part of it is because of being a military brat. And you had to make friends very quickly. Um, but also um, my mother and father were like that and all of my relatives, all of my aunts and uncles. Uh, we never met a, met a stranger. And so that's really worked out well for me. So I'm a Virginia girl all the way, all the way, all the way. So 
how did you get into sports? Mm, getting into sports. Well, being in the military, you have to, oh, I'm so sorry. I, getting into sports. So I've always been into sports. I've always been athletically inclined. Um, but my mother, um, my, my mother supported that. My mother was an intellectual. Uh, intellectual. Uh, my mother was a teacher before I had teachers. Uh, my mother was teaching us theory and English. And my father was teaching us math. And so we had school. And we were one of the kids. We had six kids. But we had school 365 days a year, seven days a week. Because even if you didn't have homework, my parents would make up homework for you. So, um, so we had that covered. And being um, in the military, you have to be, you have to have sound body, body, mind, and soul. And part of having a sound mind and body is being in shape. And you are, if you weren't in the military, you were still a little soldier who grew up saying the Pledge of Allegiance of the flag. Um, and every morning, every morning, and being and living on military bases like Fort Monroe, one of my favorite places in the world, no matter what you were doing, playing a soccer game, uh, riding down the street on your bike, crabbing in the moat of Fort Monroe, when that cannon went off at the top of the hour, you got out of your car, you got off your bike, you, got, you stood up at the field and you put your hand over your heart. And you vowed and you committed to being an American, you committed to loving America and loving Americans and wanting the best for America. Um, and I love that, actually. <laughs> I love that about the patriotism, camaraderie, more than just patriotism, it's camaraderie of togetherness, collectiveness, in a positive way uh, that I grew up with. And so with all of that, like I said, soccer field, I played every sport that there is. I love sports. You have to be in shape. Um, so we had the Presidential Physical Fitness Award. And for years, they don't even have that anymore, I don't think, where you had to, um, you had to take, you know, gym classes, but also you had the 50-yard dash. You had to throw the so softball. You had to do a certain amount of sit-ups in a certain period of time. You had to do the pull-ups or the flex arm hang. Um, and um, so I had been doing that as soon as it started like until it stopped I every year. And if you won and you, you were in the top percentile of your, um, your age group, then you would get a, a, a patch for the president, president, um, the physical fitness award. And I think I have six of them. So I did it six years. And if you have a, a certificate signed by the president and you would hang that up on your wall. And my parents were really great. They saved everything that we had. So I still have those. And so in the midst of all of that, um, there were two other things that really kind of shaped me as far as going into sports. I love working with the team. I love working together to, for positive results, like winning a game or really fighting together and giving it the best shot that we could. I really, really love that. And you get a lot of that in good leadership. You get a lot of that in sports. And no matter whether you're white, black, female, whatever the case may be, you, get, you have to get along and let's get it done. I love that. Um, when I was very young doing the physical fitness award, um, Mr. Faxon, which was a, a former, I think I had him twice, like his second grade and sixth grade, I think. He always made me perform with the boys. And I did not like that. I wanted to be with the girls. And, you know, it's like doing the cheerleading thing where all the cheerleaders line up at the bottom and then you have the next row and you have the next row. Well, I was on the bottom row because I was strong, I was tall, I was broad shouldered and I could hold up these friends of mine. And But I wanted to be that one on top that goes, okay, you know, but I couldn't figure that out. And I was thinking, why do I have to play with the boys? Why do I have to run with the boys? Why do I have to compete with the boys? And Right then, Mr. Faxon, he told me, um, you have to be where your skill level is. You have to be exactly where you're supposed to be for your skill level and your, your talent. And so if that means you have to run with them and they just happen to be boys, then that's what you're going to do because it's only going to make you better. And I never complained about it ever again. Um, 
And I think it was because of that, that I was able to go on. Um, and with the, the teachings of my parents that you could do anything you put your mind to. Um, I ended up being the first female little league player in the history of the state of Kentucky. And why? Because my sister took the last cheerleading job when we moved to Kentucky. I think it was Kentucky. Sometimes I'm not really sure where we lived. I just know what house it was or something. And the Bad News Bears had nothing on me. Being the only female and I was hitting home runs, I learned misogyny at a very young age and I learned how to address it at a very young age. And uh, I never, I learned how to have courage. And sports is permeating through all of these stories that I'm telling. The things that I learned, the characteristics as far as being a leader and having to be transformational and standing on your own because it's the right thing to do. And when I would walk down the dugout, the little boys would push me and my head would hit the dugout uh, uh, all the way down, but I stayed on that. And I was the one who hit that winning run, that triple that brought in the winning run for the championship. And I never told my parents about it. I, dealt, I just dealt with it. And even the baseball coach, when I was hitting home runs, he got up there and he wanted to throw me a pitch. He says, let me do it. I didn't know. I was very young. I was a little girl. And that ball kept getting closer and closer to my stomach. And I go like this and I, I was scared until he finally hit me in my gut. And I was like, I had tears in my eyes, but I did, they didn't fall. Because if you would know your fortitude and your courage and your bravery and your calling and your mission, when someone hits you in the gut or backs you up into a wall, where I came up with this courage to stay. And I didn't say a word. I just kept hitting that ball and hitting those home runs and hitting those triples. I didn't let them redefine who I was. I didn't know that's what I was doing at the time. I just knew you weren't going to scare me or intimidate me. That's all I knew. And I continued to stay on that team. And it's because I stayed on that team, we won the championship. I think about that to this day and how many times being the only or the first uh, that I've had to do, how these moments in sports helped define, create, and develop who I am today. The strong person that I am today. I didn't do it alone. I have my brother Clifton, who was the oldest brother. <clears throat> I'm the third child. Thank you, pardon. And my sister and my brother had to take me everywhere. And that meant when Clifton went out to play football, he had to take his little sister, Janice. And I would watch him and he was, oh, he's my favorite. I love Clifton. I love all my sisters and brothers and my mom and dad. And then my best friends and then my first role model, my first idol. Anyways, um, so Clifton, instead of having to look after me, he started teaching me how to play football. And then baseball came. And instead of looking after me, because, you know, he can't play basketball, look at your little sister. Um, I, I, uh, he would teach me how to play baseball and he would teach me how to play basketball and he would force me to play with all of his friends who were mostly boys. And there were some awesome girl uh, players as well. Women players, girl players at the time, young girls, but they were only the best. You could only play the pickup ball with the best male or female. Doesn't matter what your skill level is, what matters. And I learned that at a very young age too. And so because of my brother, um, I learned how to play every sport. Um, because of my best friend, Cheryl Jones in second grade and first grade, I think I saw her one other time. She taught me how, she taught me karate. My sister was a track star. She taught me how to run. Um, and my father was a great athlete uh, as well. And so it was just one of the things, my mother believed that you're going to be involved in Extra, extracurricular activities. So besides learning a different language that you had to do in the military, you had to learn a different language. Um, you had to be physically fit and uh, you had to read books and, and that sort of thing. But, um, and then as time went on, I just saw some really great models. I, I was fortunate to meet some really wonderful people and like uh, uh, 
Billie Jean King was one of my idols because uh, she was just an amazing tennis player. And, and they were, you know, really teasing her about whether she's going to beat this guy Riggs. And, and she did. And I was like, oh, my God, women can do it, too. They're, she's so awesome. And uh, Althea Gibson, I was able to meet her and shake her hand when I was working in North Carolina and see all the wonderful things that she did. And, uh, but also going to Wake Forest and hearing the story and growing up on the story of Brian Piccolo. And uh, all so many great people at Wake Forest who were just great human beings. Uh, they, they showed me and, and my wonderful people at Bethel High School, I have some of the biggest and greatest friends and fans on the peninsula, uh, Virginia people. Um, some of the greatest people who played for the Chicago Bears. Um, and all, the, when you get down to it, like Alan Iverson, when you get down to it, you talk to them, they're just normal human beings that do extraordinary things. Um, and so um, sports was it. I happened to be good at it. Um, I like making the the school proud. I like pulling it together from my teammates and friends and working with them. I loved how they taught me to be a better player uh, than I was when I came on. Uh, so, you know, sports has really been a huge part of my life um, that teaches me, that has taught me so much about character and, and all those great things. So. I know that was a very long answer. <laughs> no, there you go. <laughs> that's, we we wanted to we want to hear that insight um, mm -hmm. and speak. That's actually a great segue. Uh, your Bethel High School. Uh, mm -hmm. What was it during that time when you're at Bethel and you're making your decision about where am I going next? What is what is the next thing? What's that next level with college? What was it about Wake that you said you know I want to go to Wake? Mm -hmm. Okay, so here I am playing at Bethel High School and Coach Jesse Pope is really trying to help me vet like where I should go, why shouldn't I go there, whatever. She really didn't persuade me one way or the other. She would just help me if I had questions and that sort of thing. And so I, I, I had narrowed all of the scholarship offers down to two. One was West Point and um, one was Wake Forest. And my uncle, Dr. Herman Yuri, who wanted me to go to Wake Forest, he thought it'd be a great school. A good, wonderful family friend of mine, Dr. Maya Angelo, who also spoke at my grandmother's funeral, did a fabulous job. And she's been, she was, uh, before her passing, she was giving me ex exposés and, oh, and really wonderful interviews while I was in television working. She would always give me that, that special interview that she didn't give anyone else. I love that. Um, but she wanted me to go to Wake Forest. And she thought it would be good for me to go there and where she and my uncle and my aunt could really watch over me um, in North Carolina. And, but I just wasn't sure of where to go. And so I had already, um, my uncle invited me down to Winston-Salem, North Carolina with Coach Briley, Wanda Briley and Lori Bailey to actually audition. They were kind of interested, but I needed to audition. And so I went. And I tried out for an audition, like an open audition. And then all of a sudden, I started seeing them in the stands in, at, at, in Hampton, Virginia. And uh, they were there. They called me a lot saying, you know, how are you doing in school? Because, I, you know, at Wake Forest, we're known for, especially women athletes, being student athletes. So you have to be a good student as well as a good athlete. You can't just do one over the other necessarily. And so I was thinking they were very supportive of that. And they came to my banquet when I won uh, awards for Bethel High School. Um, they were there at the banquet. They presented me a jersey. Um, and I mean, they were just really on it. And West Point was really awesome as well. And um, being in the military, it was very, very tough. And so being a Christian, I said, well, they're both supposed to call me at this particular day at five o'clock, wherever I'm supposed to go, they'll be the first person to call. And Wake Forest called at five o'clock. And as I'm putting the receiver down, uh, it rings, West Point was calling. Um, and um, I just felt that it worked out the way that it worked out. I love the fact that 
my uncle and aunt and uh, my Angelo was going to be there uh, to take care of me. Uh, Dr. Angelo even offered to build a full court in her backyard so I could stay with her because I was invited to stay in the Spanish house, um, but also her house. But as a freshman, you can't live off campus on a scholarship until you're a senior, I don't think. So I was able, never able to do that. Um, but it was absolutely wonderful where Wake Forest just going on campus, just absolutely beautiful. Um, having teachers that taught you up, they, they, they taught you to where they saw you and where you should be. So they did not see me as a stereotypical, negative stereotypical uh, black female athlete where that's all I can do is bounce a ball. They were some of my biggest fans. They came to every single game, but they were also there uh, making sure all my homework and everything was done. My coaches were where I had study hall and all of that. Um, so I love that, that combination of, of things. I love the fact that I could be, um, that praying was okay there, uh, where being Christian was okay. Uh, being Jewish was okay. Um, being Catholic was okay. Um, and my spirituality is very, very important to me. Um, and then I would say that um, being with some of the most awesome people in college athletics. And I mean, from football players that supported us and came to every game, basketball players that came to every game, um, Doc Casey, Bert Woodard, all these people who worked to make sure that you were a success, that they were there for you. Just like they were there for me, they were there for the entire team. They were there for the entire team. Um, and I really, 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 really like that. They never left you alone to just flounder uh, when it came to your grades or, you know, because going to college can be very different. And, 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 and being the third African-American basketball, female basketball player in the history uh, was very different, but I was treated well. And I was treated fairly, no different than my other teammates because my teammates were stars. They were the stars, I remember them now. Um, every single one of them um, that were brilliant, kind, loving, and could play some basketball. I absolutely love it. So Wake Forest was it for me. Well, I want to ask you about that. So mm -hmm. you, you get to Wake and you're starting your college career. Mm -hmm. And so you're playing, uh, you know, this top level talent. Who mm -hmm. was the player or what was the team that just seemed to bring out the best in you? Who was that team that, yeah. you know, and you know, in sports, you always, every game is important, but mm -hmm. as an athlete, you know, and I know having been there, there were just some teams you just seem to really get geared up for. Who was that team for you? Oh my God, Carolina. <laughs> the, the Tar Heels, <laughs> they had so much, I mean, bleed blue, read blue, think blue, sing blue. You go into their town, there's blue footprints, <laughs> paw prints on the on the on the street. And and oh my God, these girls are just uh, like I wanted to beat them real bad. <laughs> we all wanted to beat them real bad. Sometimes we did. I think maybe once or twice we did, but they were an awesome team. I mean. Pam Leakes and and they just had, I remember Pam Leakes because I was always guarding her and she was guarding me for the most part. And, um, but it was Carolina, it was Duke. Duke was really, they were very nice. They were very nice players. Um, I remember Duke being very nice. And, but I have to say Carolina was it. But we were ready, we had to get ready. We were conditioned. Um, Coach Tuza, at the time, Coach Briley and Coach Bailey, I'm telling you, I they we were in some of the best condition to handle any team at any time. 
And um, I need to get in touch with them right now to get back into shape, actually, <laughs> with all this pandemic and holiday cheer. Um, but no, um, I would say Carolina. I, 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 hey, if we lost, it felt okay, you know, but we were ready for you next time. And the one or two times I think we won, oh my God, what a feeling. Oh my goodness, that was just amazing. So it, wasn't just, so it wasn't just me and it wasn't just football. It was it was like that in, in other sports <laughs> with other people. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> that's, that's a great, that's good to know. Uh, so yeah. I want to ask you this. It's night, it's you're playing your junior year, and you how did you find out you were all ACC? And what was that moment like being that first? Um my goodness. I I wasn't I really never played or did anything for attention. Um and I I just wanted to play. I just wanted to play and do a great job and do the best that I can for my team. So when I found out about that and they announced that, I was like, really? So what does that mean? Um, it's like, I just did a job and yeah, part of this belongs to my team members who helped me develop into the player that I am. And part of that, are the fans that were out in the bleachers that cheered me on or I, I wasn't sure whether I could make that shot. And it, it just, I just felt that it was really great for everyone, but I also felt that I really have to make sure uh, that I do the best that I can to represent Wake Forest and the Lady Deeks, as we were called. And I wanted to be better. I wanted to be, uh, to be a great, continue to be a great citizen to be continue to be a great teammate uh to be to continue to be a, a, a great deacon <laughs> um it gave me pride it uh but I, I i i'm always like that i think anytime i win anything like winning the emmy awards i wasn't even i didn't even submit it was my news director Mark pimentel and and Steve Shipowitz, who actually turned in my work because they felt that it was of value. And it just so happens I was nominated for six in my first year and, and, and won three that year. And then I was, but it's because of their belief in me. And that's why it's a really blessing when other people see things in you. I just wanted to work and work hard and get the job done. At the same time, it does mean something when you are among your peers and you're voted for something that your peers have said, wow, you've done this. Or like when I won the Peninsula, um, all of, when I won the Peninsula All-Star um, Best Female Athlete and on, on the Peninsula, uh, Coach Jesse Pope called me. I didn't even know I had been nominated or anything. Um, and I have to say uh, in, all, in all authenticity, uh, when you ask me about these awards and I love to do that and open the doors for other people and it has helped open doors for me. But I have to say, in all authenticity, um, I give all the praise and glory to God um, because it was, it was his love for me, God's love for me that allowed me to continue to push on. Um, and to, he blessed me and gave me the wonderful opportunity at Wake Forest. And Ed Chris, 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 Christman, Christian, Ed, Ed, I always called him Dr. Ed. And he always said, oh, call me this. Ed um, loved him so much. And and Dr. Scales and um, Cook Griffin and all these people who just were really um, fundamental. I thought I had already won without winning anything. <laughs> I thought I had already won by, by having some of the most awesome friends, Amy Privet, Sonia Henderson, um, just a lot of people just meant so much to me. Um, having been taught by the late great Dolly McPherson, Dr. Angelo, being taught biology by my uncle. That was awesome. And the first African American. And the second, Dolly McPherson was the first female African American uh, to be at Wake Forest. So um, 
as far as sports, we're talking sports, uh, but I take everything and all that I am with me. Um, I was proud. I was proud of winning that award. Um, I was proud of winning any and every award. And I, I work every day of my life um, in all that I do um, to create a place and a platform for others to win as well. I want them to win that award. I tell my students, I want you to do better than I did in television. I tell my students, the guys who want to play me basketball, oh, basketball they, they see ACC, they don't care if you're a girl, they want to play you one time. Yeah. And I did that at, at Ohio, yeah. So I mean, anyway, that's a lot ahead. to, yeah. But that's a lot to aspire though. I mean, you're talking all ACC. I mean, you're talking six Emmys. I don't know if any, if everybody's heard that, <laughs> you know, but that's a, <laughs> that, that's, that's a lot. Uh, yeah, but, and that. again, to add to it, another uh, great uh, Wake Forest moment in 2015, uh, you are honored as an ACC tournament legend. I mean, mm -hmm. what does that feel like to, <laughs> to have someone reflect back on your body of work and be a part of, uh, of such a great thing like the ACC tournament legend, considering the ACC tournament is one of the biggest, if not the biggest in the country? Yeah. Kevin, ah, oh, you're gonna make me cry. Um, um, it meant a lot. Um, I'm sorry, I think about I think about what it means to all of the little girls who, who want to achieve great things. What that means to them to see, I'm sorry, excuse me. What that means to see someone, uh, a girl being at, being honored to be at the top of her game or I think not just that with little girls, I think about what that means for Wake Forest and the good people of Wake Forest and the ACC to find me worthy of such a wonderful honor. It's still um, overwhelming for me when I didn't expect it. I didn't know about it until I heard about it. And I also think about what it means to, um, to be a woman of color, to teach the world, to teach people in sports of all colors and races, white, black, brown, that everyone has value and I think of the little child that may look like me, that she can have a dream of doing great things and being a good person. I think it's an honor. It is a responsibility uh, that I don't take lightly. Um, and then, and I wanna say it was a happy moment. Oh my gosh, the way I was treated, oh my gosh. I mean, they took such great care of me, um, which is really wonderful and awesome. Uh, but I have to tell you that one of the things I remember most, one of the things I took with me uh, when I was honored with all of the other wonderful women, um, who when I heard their story, who had been through so much in their lives, some of them, and so they have been winning. They won the ACC, but they had already been winning. They have been fighting and beating cancer. They went through a terrible relationship and they got through that. Just a lot of things that makes them champs in my eyes. And I was honored to be among them. Uh, but I also remember all of the wonderful Americans of all races that 
somehow, someday, some way, they found a way to have the courage to allow women's basketball to flourish. They have the courage to say that we've never had an African-American uh, football player, basketball player. They had the courage to say, you know, it's time. Let's do that. Because it, every story, every ending, every award has a story and a beginning. And I took that with me. Uh, what that happened. Every person that made it possible for me to play at Wake Forest and then to be honored in that way. Um, and then I also think about the dear loved ones, um, such as Lori Durham, who's not with us anymore. I think about what that meant for her, you know, and the fact that it's because of her assist or her her defense or something that she guard she did for me on the court allowed me to to make that basket and that sort of thing. Because anything I do, I take my teammates with me as well. And so even though I may have my name on it, and and it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful honor. Um, and I have my dad there, and I had my stepmom there, and because my mother passed away in 2002, but I had her with me spiritually. And see, they were, it was wonderful for them to be there. My brother and his wife, were, they, it was just wonderful for to have my family there uh, to see good things happen to me. And, um, and to see all the other women that I looked up to even then, where I looked at them and I was like, I remember when you played and still I think tall women and, and they're so awesome and so graceful. And uh, they're, they're like warriors, warriors. Warriors, female warriors, women warriors to me, and uh, that are just amazing uh, uh, to me. And uh, so I was really thrilled uh, to be there. Uh, ACC, I love the ACC still to this day. Uh, I think it's one of the best, if not the best division. Nothing against the other division, it's all good. Um, but I grew up in the ACC, so um, I, was, I was really, really, uh, truly honored. Uh, to have been um, given that wonderful, wonderful, wonderful gift that I hope yes. to get back. An impactful experience that you've had as a as a journalist, and and I want to talk about uh, something else that you worked on that had a great impact on you, as you you talked about before, is mm -hmm. a project called Journey to My Mother's Land: Extending sure. the Gates Effect into Africa. Kind of. Nah, Give some yeah. insight on on that project and, and its impact on you. Oh, wonderful. Yes, I'd love to. Um, I would say that um, the biggest impact, so I'm a, I, I'm a doctor, I have a doctor of philosophy, and um, I look at ways of demarginalization de of every individual and of situations. So anything in the, in the corner, um, I look at that and, and, and see what's going on. Uh, to bring it to the forefront. And with Journey to My Mother's Land, I was a big fan. I am a big fan of Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr. And he has the PBS show, Who Do You Think You Are? Finding Your Roots. And that sort of thing. And I remember reading a story in, in 2012, I believe it was, um, where he said what he noticed was talking with all of the celebrities, the African-American celebrities, um, they had an emotional connection to the slavery aspect of being an American but they did not have an emotional connection to when he told them about their African tribe. And so being a scholar and a researcher, I was looking at it qualitatively and quantitatively about self-esteem, lead, um, uh, leadership development, transformational leadership development, working within a collective, being within a collective, um, being a minority, things along those lines. I looked at it when it first came to women. I looked at it when it came to people who were physically special, people from other countries. I looked at it as race, gender, sexual orientation, um, because I believe everyone has value, period. Positive value for this world. So what I found the gap, what we talk about the gap in the research of that, even though it's qualitative with Dr. Henry Louis Gates with his, with his work, um, I looked at the quantitative aspects as well. And I said, how is it that African-Americans 
when we talk about quantitative statistics, how is it that African Americans have the highest in college, okay, have the highest self esteem on the Rosenberg self esteem scale compared to other groups, okay, including white male? How is it that they have that high self esteem? But when I see or witness something in the in, in the classroom, when I look at the qualitative aspects, um, I didn't see a lot of transformational leadership. How is it? How is it affecting them to have this high self esteem? But then you still on college campuses, you still have people um, writing terrible things on the walls and 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 calling them bad names. And how does that affect them? And then I started looking at Chicago, and I started looking at all of these other areas as far as what is the one thing they don't have? What are we doing wrong here? As a, as a doctor, I'm looking at that. I'm trying to figure out. And I said, well, one of the things that I found out, other than that, in addition to the interview with Dr. Henry Lewis Gates and all of the work that I looked at him, at his work, I said, number one, um, we are the single aggregate as African-Americans that you can ask a 10 year old child or an eight year old child, when you hear African American or black American, name five things that come to your mind first. And in those five things, there will absolutely be an item that involves the enslavement of black people. The only one. And so I said, okay, there's something there. No one else has to deal with that. A lot of immigrants and people who have immigrated, they like to say, well, I pulled myself up out of the bootstrap. Apples and oranges. Apples and oranges, especially if you don't have brown skin. Apples and oranges. And so I said, you know, there's a way. I call myself an abolitionist at my root. Um, because of my upbringing, because of my beliefs, that everyone has a special purpose in this world. And it's up to us to work with one another to help each person find it. Um, I wanted to set African-Americans free in a different way. And I wanted to also educate people on what it is to be Black in America, but also what it is to be white in America. Um, and by that, two things happen. So journey to my mother's land, I'm thinking, okay, I need to know, and African-Americans, a lot of them know, or they should know, that there was so much more to them than the enslavement of their people. And not every Black person was slave, enslaved coming to America. I want to just say that, and that's another whole story. But still, with your Black, you had to deal with certain things, okay? Growing up at certain times and that sort of thing. There, it was important that they knew there was something else to them outside the borders of America. There was another history, the root of who they are. Just like we celebrate St. Patrick's Day, Cinco de Mayo, the Chinese New Year. What do we celebrate this African? Right? The beginning of civilization, the beginning of humanity. So I said, I need to explore that. So Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr. says, um, they didn't have a connection to Africa. Okay. I want to find out what the connection is. So I set out to do just that. And I just didn't want it to be my story of my mother's land. Um, I set out and I talked to four other individuals doing the DNA test from AfricanAncestry.com, Ancestry.com, but mostly AfricanAncestry.com. That's the only database that can actually tell you what tribe that you're connected to, according to your DNA. I wanted to know, number one, does the testing matter? Does it really matter that you come from Africa? Where in Africa? What tribe? Does it really matter? And what I learned was um, I tested them and I interviewed them before they took the test, when they took the test, a year after they took the test and found their results, found out the results, and then a year after. And I wanted to say, does the knowing make a difference? And every single one of them said, until I go to where I, my people are from, I don't know. And so that's what I did. Came to the University of Illinois, 
went for a scholarship before I even started my first day at the job and got the scholarship, got the, uh, the funding, um, the grant to go to the homeland, my mother's land, uh, my mother's side, which is the Mende tribe, uh, the Mende tribe of, that lives in present day Sierra Leone. Now, with that being said, understand this was what I found out. Does the knowing matter? You can, you can see it. Actually, I want it, uh, I'm going to have it on a national platform in February for Black History Month, and I'll have to tell you about that later when that's announced. Right now, you can find it on YouTube, uh, Journey to My Mother's Land, Extending the Gates Effect. So I'm extending the, the Dr. Gates Effect into Africa, where, where he didn't go with the celebrities and that sort of thing. Not just a celebrity. I'm a regular person. So what, is it, what does it mean to be Mindy? What does it mean to be Fulani? What does it mean, whatever the case may be? I have 100% DNA linkage to the Mende tribe. Some people will say, oh, well, that doesn't mean this and that doesn't mean that. Um, even though we use DNA to get people out of prison, another whole story. So what I did was I took a trip and I stayed with the Mende people in Sierra Leone, people who are my cousins, who I have a connection with. There were no other tribes on my mother's side, a connection with. So that means thousands of years ago, it was Mende. Right. And which means what? Have we lost everything crossing the middle passage? That's the question. Did it make a difference? And I will tell you, yes, it does. Because you will find out Floyd Mayweather, and I'm calling my brother out because of the fact he said he doesn't care about the Africa connection. And he thinks that he really became a fighter because what? I'm telling you, if you looked at his DNA and found out where he was from, I guarantee you, you will find that his people were known for being great fighters. I will tell you that, and this is how I know. When I met my Angelo, my Angelo, my entire life, for 30-some years, kept telling me, you remind me so much of myself. Oh, so I was a writer like her. I found her just awesome, so I never asked her to really kind of work with me or anything. I just loved her work. She was like, you remind me so much of myself. So much. It turned out, She's Mindy. I'm an abolitionist at my root. Turns out the people that turned the Amistad around who said that they were not slaves were Mindy. The King family that I had the pleasure and honor of meeting in Atlanta, Georgia, personally, Mindy. So what you find is even when my mother passed away, I, I, I stopped um, television. I don't know if you know this. You probably don't. After I won my Emmy Awards and everything, my mother had a stroke. I'm very family oriented. And I moved home to take care of my mother and father um, until they, my father could retire from the civil service. So he, he retired from the army, he retired from civil service and, and he's also a math professor. Um, and, and so my mother could retire. So I took care went along with my sister. Uh, we helped take care of my mother. I took care of my mother full time for about four years. And uh, went home, moved from Atlanta, didn't have a job, but I just knew I would be taken care of. Um, I knew God would take care of me. I moved home. And when my mother passed away seven years, uh, I went, I, I taught at Hampton University. And when that's when I went back to get my master's and my PhD. But anyways, um, I took a year. I, I was living in a six bedroom house, beautiful neighborhood. And I used that year in that house to mourn and grieve for my mother, to honor my mother. So it wasn't just sad or depressed. It was honor. I felt that my mother needed to be honored. Uh, she brought up six kids. She was a great wife, great mother. And I just felt like somebody needed to honor her. And, you know, a lot of other religions and a lot of other people, they'll tear their lapel. They'll wear, wear black. They'll go to the waters like the Gullah Geechee. We'll go to the water. So I did a Gullah Geechee and found out the Gullah Geechee are connected to Mindy. And I had already done the story before I even knew I was Mindy. So you never are too far apart from where your roots are. And, um, but anyways, end of story. I take care of my mother. I mourn for her, but I honor her for a year. Here in America, after that, they would say, do you need to get on antidepressants? Do you need to talk to someone, which I think is fabulous. Mental health is really important, but it was more of an honoring thing. And I didn't know, what is it that we do? What is it that African-Americans do? And why do I feel like, why is that my responsibility? 
when I went to Africa and I sat among my women of the Mindy tribe and they saw a picture of my mother and I told them this story. They all started laughing and they were speaking. I said, I don't, am I missing something? Uh, and they said, uh, no, no, it's a beautiful story you tell of your mother and how you honored her. And I said, well, thank you. And they said, no, no, no. You are the crier of the family. It is a spiritual position that you have been chosen for. You are the crier of the family, which means in the African rituals and the traditions, there is someone in the family in the village that's a crier of the family. They cry for the ones who need it. The difference is in Africa, I would cry uh, for my mother and father, my mother, and, but then I would go to work and they would send other uh, women, other women to cry and mourn and honor her so I could work and then come home and, and that sort of thing. So it was a, a place of honor. So my social location, emotional location, spiritual location of where I was and what I did and what I, why I felt it was so important that came from above to honor my mother. They said it was, I was chosen for that, which makes everything different, right? And, and, and it gives a history, a root. If you know who you are at the root, you can't bend. You can take off a twig, you can do that or that, but you can't bend. So it is the one unique uh, documentary that took me four years and 32 days to do because of no budget and because of the beautiful, wonderful experiences of working with some of the best in the business and the top markets of this nation. I shot, wrote, edit, produce, narrated, and reported on the entire thing. Um, that's why it took me so long because I was also publishing articles and all of that. But there was a documentary that was a labor of love, but it was a documentary to set people free. It was a documentary to say that you have not lost everything crossing the middle passage, your people crossing the middle passage. And it's important that you know who you are at the root. So did you can celebrate St. Patrick's Day because I found out I'm 26% English and Irish as well. Um, I celebrate Cinco de Mayo and, and all of these wonderful things, but also you can look at celebrating who you are and, and, and everything that you are uh, from the root. Uh, John Legend's Mindy, the guy who played back Black Panther, the late and great um, lead actor um, there, he was Mindy as well. And it's one of the most unique documentaries of, um, that actually shows you what you actually what an Afri African-American actually goes through when they connect with their people on a whole different level, on a, an emotional level, on the level of uh, being and standing on the land where perhaps your people were before they went over to America. Actually, literally standing on Bunts Island. Um, wow. That, yeah. That, I, I know that was an amazing experience for you. Um, and as a researcher, and um, an intellectual, you also develop some other things. Could you kind of share, uh, just kind of give us a broad perspective on uh, active centralized empowerment? What, oh, you sure. know, kind of what that is. And because uh -huh. uh, I came across it I was, as I was looking at some of the things that you worked on and that kind of jumped out at me. But could you kind of share with everybody uh, what, what that is? Okay. Uh, if you can hear, can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, okay, great. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Uh, it's um, okay. Something came through on my phone and knocked us out. So yeah, a broad experience of um, active centralized environment. So part of, um, for the past 15, 16 years, I've been looking at how to help people reach their optimal performance. Um, Free to do that. Um, people are at my, at my door, but we'll finish. Um, that how to do that, how to um, be free, how to be who you are authentically um, without apology, uh, because I believe everybody is worthy of love. So um, part of going over to uh, journey to my mother's land um, and coming back and saying, I felt more free than ever coming back. I have to say that. Um, 
I felt that that the enslavement part was just a small part of the African American story. And uh, I felt proud of being an American. I felt proud of being an African American. And I felt proud to be a Black American. All three. So it's awesome. So I will tell you that. And part of that is active centralized empowerment. Active centralized empowerment is a praxis and a theory. And also part of my critical pedagogy that I use in my classes to bring out the best performance, the most authentic performance of my students. It means to be actively centralized on a positive, empowering purpose. So it's being actively centralized on the very best of who you are, your very special value that only you can give to the world, whatever that is. Actively centralizing yourself to accept yourself to be authentic that will then empower you through self-agency and self-empowerment to move yourself from the margins. And that applies to anyone. So you can be a professor who feels that technology has brought a digital divide between you and your students, okay? What active centralized empowerment says, no, just be who you are actively centralize yourself in that you're a phenomenal teacher, um, phenomenal teacher. You know what you're doing, you know what you're talking about. So move yourself from the margins by being inclusive perhaps and saying authentically, I'm not really sure how to do this podcast. Does any student in the classroom know how to work the computer? And oh my goodness, you will get 15 students up there to help not only teach you, teach the class, but you learn how to work together and achieve great things together as a collective. That's active centralized empowerment. It brings out the best in the student, the best in the community. So when I give a best in the professor, um, active centralized empowerment means that no matter what anybody tells me, I know my roots, where I am in Africa, uh, my people, um, and also the Balanta tribe of Guinea-Bissau on my father's side, that's two tribes. I'm also going to go back, I'm a Collins, I'm Irish. I'm gonna to go to Ireland and be with my people. So once I know who I am, I am authentically, I'm a Christian, um, I'm a woman, whatever the case may be, I don't care who you are. I don't care what you are. I don't care if you're poor. I don't care if you're rich. I don't care if you're white, if you're black. Everyone can feel marginalized in some way. Doesn't mean you're systemically marginalized, but you can feel dismissed. And what active centralized empowerment um, does for my book, 250 Years is Still a Slave, but Breaking Free with Active Centralized Empowerment. I talk about and write about, not only do African-Americans and Black people have to free themselves from the de definition from other people, uh, but white Americans have to free themselves as well. White Americans are not free. A lot of people say, oh my God, they have everything. No, they really don't. Um, because if you think about it, why did a lot of white Americans fell in love with a person of color? But being white in America, being in their family, being at their job, whatever, they will never be able to love that person out loud and open. That's not freedom. Another person will be uh, a football player, a great football player, but it turns out that he loves another who looks like him. He will never be free um, to love one another. So I'm not advocating for anything other than I believe that people um, should have the opportunity, whether you're in a wheelchair. Uh, I have two, oh, I love this story about one of my former students. Uh, he was in a wheelchair, he's in a wheelchair. Um, he, he's physically special. I call it physically special. Um, but he was a captain of the uh, wheelchair basketball team. And the University of Illinois has the best program for people who are physically special. And he was in my classroom and he was telling me how his former professors allowed him to do this and do that. And he doesn't do this and he doesn't do that because he's in a wheelchair. And you know, as the athlete that I am and all of that, an act of centralized empowerment means Absolutely not. You're going to do everything that everybody else does. And we're going to find out a way that you can do that with the right equipment. And you're going to get in there and you're going to do this, you're going to do that. And he was terrified and he was had anxiety, but I've seen this so many times. 
whether you're a woman, uh, whether you're gay, whether you're straight, whether you're poor, if you're poor, you're going to be my treasurer because you know how to balance a dollar. You know how to stretch a dollar and stretch a budget. So you're going to be our treasurer. We're never going to lose money. There's beautiful, there's beauty in every single person's value. So you're the captain on the basketball team in a wheelchair. Okay, whatever. You're still going to be the anchor of your own show. You're still going to produce your own show. You're going to write and shoot and edit your own show. And that's exactly what he did. And he had a job right out of college, right out of college in one of the top markets in Indiana. And he's working master control, which is the operating circulating system of any TV station who does all the commercials. And he has to do math and arithmetic and all that. So multiple intelligences. So active centralized empowerment means that you have the empowerment and self-agency to be who you are in an environment like that, that you could be everything that you want to be. You could do everything that you want to do just like anybody else and by through self-agency and empowerment because I could only guide him, but it was through his confidence in himself and knowing who he was authentically, being a leader, being a captain, being part of a team that he knew exactly what he had to do and he did it and he does it brilliantly. That's what active centralized empowerment is. I have a book out that I uh, wrote uh, I just just launched yesterday called Teaching Without Borders um, that I wrote because my over the years, I've won awards for my teaching. I've won international and national awards for my teaching, creative endeavors, service, and rock, scholarship research, uh, quantitative, qualitative as well, and my creative endeavors. But I had um, students would always say, Professor Collins, or I would do faculty development workshops to bring out to teach a discipline, a subject, but also to bring out the best in your in learning environment where everyone has a voice and everyone is valued. Um, and so after studying it with, uh, I use multiple intelligences, Dr. Howard Gardner's multiple intelligences, Rosenberg's self-esteem scale, Trisha Nadoff's leadership development styles. So it's really solid in the research, but I wrote a book just for that professor, that faculty person, who wants to be more inclusive with active centralized empowerment to bring out the best in you and your classroom. And I talk about how to set your classroom up, um, how to deal with, um, how to address the wonderful aspects of someone coming from another country. Uh, so for instance, my, my students who speak different languages, whether they're, especially if they're from another country, I have them, I allow them to do uh, certain things in English, but also in their language. I think it's really important that they can send back to China or uh, they can send uh, to Spain or, or whatever the case may be, Africa. Um, so my latest book that just came out yesterday that is on Cogn Cognella Publishing is called Teaching Without Borders, um, Creating Equity and Inclusion Through Active Centralized Empowerment. And I even talk about the pandemic. How can you practice pa inclusion during a pandemic? Well, I show you how to do that. So it, it, it permeates everything that I do. It permeates the fact of um, my nonprofit, World Changers Media International uh, Foundation, um, that I seek and open the doors and create platforms for youth here in Chicago, youth in the Cameroon, youth in India, youth, white, black, doesn't matter, to tell their own story. It's important that they have the power and know how to use the power responsibly uh, to tell their own stories. No one can tell a story better than them, than the person that's involved. And um, that is active centralized empowerment. It is collective unison and unity on a positive, uh, affirming movement that we have. So I call them world changers. My members, my board members, are all world change agents. Uh, Dr. Joseph Opala is part of it, who discovered the connection between the Gullah Geechee and the Mindy. I'm now working, talking with them and, and, and working on some things in the future. Um, so active centralized empowerment is like um, the late, the, the wonderful, not late, the wonderful Dr. Bell Hooks, Bell Hooks talks about, scholar. There's power in the margin. That's what she talks about. Paolo Fiore talks about power in the margins and uh, the 
pedagogy of the oppressed, how to overcome. And, and I take all of that uh, and say there's power in the margins. Yes, there is power in the margins, but there is also power in the marginalized to move oneself from the margins and redirect and relocate that core of America, that core of who you are. And by the core of America, I mean coming together on one for good, as one for good. Um, that's active to centralize the power And that everybody is love. Everybody should be loved, deserves love. Everyone has value. And you don't have to, it's almost like agreeing to disagree, but what are we going to do to move forward? So active centralized empowerment is not about agreeing with each other. It's about respecting one another, understanding one another. So therefore you can find empathy, compassion. You can find synergy and saying, hey, this is the way that we need to go. And um, it's been used in classrooms. It's been used in, uh, in Chicago for, uh, it's been used in organizations, corporations. Um, who want to be more inclusive and diversive, um, and diverse, I'm not diversive. <laughs> um, so they use active centralized empowerment. So I hope I explained that. Uh, oh yeah, you, you did. <laughs> and, and uh, having gone through and, you know, doing some research on the things that you're working on and things you have worked on, uh, that's why I really wanted you to uh, talk about that. Thank you. And I'm glad you did because it shows that your entire life has been about bringing people together on a positive vibe, whether it was being a leader on the court, uh, the things that you have done as a as a journalist, as a professor, uh, your, your documentaries have been about pulling people together. And I just wanted you to share more uh, about that. where that, you know, kind of where that comes from. And so, mm -hmm. uh, again, thank you for, you know, taking the time. But I, I would love yeah. to uh, kind of end it with this last question with uh, with your vast experience in so mm -hmm. many different areas and your uh, level of excellence in uh, in so many different areas. What advice would you give a current student athlete at Wake, what, what insight would you share with them? Always try to remain positive. Reach out to people who may be able to help you. A lot of times, young people, they feel they have to do everything on their own, especially anyone from the margins or individuals who have been marginalized. They always, you know, people say, pull yourself up by the bootstrap. Um, no. Um, that's what they're for, there for. I tell them, I would tell them to like my dad told us, no matter what teacher you have, absolutely drain them of everything that you can about what they know. And then also understand this, that you, there's more to you than your grades. Pass your courses, graduate, but know who you are as a human being is what's most important. And has you learn these wonderful things. I will tell you what Wake did for me. Um, I was always a good student. I made straight A's till I was 13, I think. When I went to public school, things changed. And then I went through a little bump when I went to Wake Forest because I was there by myself kind of, and it was new and it was different. And it's having two jobs. Any student athlete should be proud of themselves or any student at Wake, because especially student athletes, because you're like working two full-time jobs. Playing sports is a full-time job and going to school. And I always said, if I didn't play basketball, I know my C's would be B's, my B's would be A's. I would make straight A's and I did, but my master and my PhD, I made straight A's pretty much, except for one, I think, uh, philosophy, which I was taught by a Harvard professor, which I thought was really good. I ended up with a B. But even with all of that, even if I say all of that, what Ohio University did for me, what Wake Forest University did for me, is they allowed me to grow, to challenge, to address, to develop the person who I was yet to be. They allowed me Wake Forest 
allowed me to make mistakes, fall down every now and then. But seeking out the right people and saying, I'm not really sure what I'm doing here or being involved with other classmates really saved me. Um, because school is about, they test you on not what you know, but what you don't know. So it's okay. You don't have to know everything. You'll learn. And most importantly, it's about life outside of the classroom. Everything you're learning, all the discipline that you're learning, all of the uh, new ways of inventions and arithmetic and English and dance, music, all of that is for you to explore who you really are and where do you fit in and to this beautiful purpose that you were born with and has in your life. So enjoy your time at Wake. Enjoy everything there is about it. And know that the ebbs and flows and the ins and outs are all a part of what is your preparation for your elevation. And I know I tell people, why do they have to rhyme all the time? And I do that because my brother, I love him so much. When I go through hard times, he tells me my preparation for my elevation. So don't get down. It's going to be okay. You're in a, one of the best schools in this country. And you're being taught by some of the best people. You can always go to Wake Chapel. You can always go to the quad. You can always do whatever. And just enjoy it. You're in a great school with great people. And you're going to do just fine. And anytime you eat, just reach out. And I promise you, somebody will be there. And good luck to you. All the best. And I'm ready for you to ace it. Get my book. <laughs> we need my to have program. you come and give that pimp talk at the beginning of every semester. That I'd was, that was awesome. <laughs> that was awesome. With I'd Dr. Collins, uh, again, thank you for... Uh, coming and being a part of Deke to Deke and helping us to engage uh, and inspire. Um, this was uh, so inspirational. I really appreciate you taking the you. time out and coming and, and being a part of this and uh, sharing your story. Uh, oh, it's my pleasure. Well, thank you so much. Uh, You're very welcome.